All right, chapter six for staying fat for Sarah Burns. From across the ward, I watch Virgil Burns sitting next to Sarah Burns on the couch. His eyes burning into the side of her head, teeth clenched so tight it looks like there's a marble below his jawbone. He's talking, but his lips barely move. Dressed in his traditional black, angular as a hawk, he cuts a fearsome, dangerous profile. I can't see her eyes, but Sarah Burns' head moves not one iota, and I'm guessing she's locked onto her favorite spot. Mr. Burns sits back, breathing deep, then momentarily puts his mouth close to her ear and stands to leave. Virgil Burns is really a scary dude. He's one of those shadowy people you can't imagine ever having been a kid. The kind of man a dog circles warily, his hackles at attention. Mr. Burns doesn't talk much, but his glare makes Mott look like Bambi. The most telling thing about him is how afraid he makes Sarah Burns. Sarah Burns isn't afraid of much, but your mention of her dad's name dramatically increases your chances of a black eye and a bloody nose. I stand against the back desk, trying hard to fade into the background as he moves toward the exit, but he spots me and moves in my direction. His black, broad-brimmed hat rides low over his eyes, and a tattered black cotton sport coat pulls tight on his broad shoulders. His gray shirt is buttoned to the top, and his dark, baggy pants complete the picture of death. Come calling at your door in the middle of a dark, rainy night. That might sound a bit dramatic, but I want to tell you, Sarah Burns' pappy gives me maximum creeps. You're Calhoun, he says, standing a few feet from me. Yes, sir. He glances back at Sarah Burns, then back to me. She say anything to you? No, sir. He's quiet another moment, staring hard at my eyes. I hold his gaze, vowing not to blink or look away, while sweat glands pop open like kernels of popcorn. You let me know if she does. Yes, sir. The attendant stands patiently by the open door, keys dangling from her hand, and Mr. Burns disappears into the outer hallway. I think I detect the fleeting shadow of a sneer across Sarah Burns's lip as I slip onto the seat beside her, but I know it must be my imagination, and I can't help thinking back to what Dale Thornton said that day. I think we ought to do an expose on that little rat, Elgin Green, Dale said pacing the wooden floor of our attic hideaway. Little goofball's got some kind of bad news stink to him. We could chase it down, maybe find it come out, come from a giant comet turd landing in his backyard or something. You know, exploding all over his family whenever it hit. Dale had definitely become comfortable with the content, if not the spirit of our bi-weekly rag. I sat at the keyboard, chin propped in one hand, feeding myself non-stop Laura Dunes with the other, a major writer's block shrouding me like the stench around Elgin Green. Sarah Burns lay on the couch, heels planted firmly against the arm, absently drumming her hands on her stomach along with the Kingston trio, one of whom was running like a dog through the Everglades. I've told you a thousand times, we don't pick on guys like Elgin Green. He's one of us, only helpless. Oh, Green ain't helpless. Get downwind from that kid. He's a powerful mother, he laughed, nodding. Yep, I think an expose on Elgin Green is right what we need. First of all, it's expose, say, Sarah Burns said. Not expose, Jesus. You could at least learn to say it right. And second, we pick on people who do us dirt. Picture us good guys, Dale. Hard as that may be for you. We're champions of the underdog. Underdogs call Elgin Green an un underdog. We're not giving him a hard time, and that's it. So you come up with something, Dale said. You're so damn smart, got your brains all wrapped up in your ugly head by them scars. Dale was going for the throat. It didn't take much to wound him. Killing him was something else. That's the only reason you stay so smart. None of it gets out because it's packed in there so good. No half-witted remark about burn scars ever got a rise out of Sarah Burns, not since maybe first grade. Oh, Dale, she said sarcastically, you're just so darn clever. 
I bet all the girls swoon. Got lots of dates lined up for the weekend? Up yours, he said. You really ain't so damn smart. You think you got everybody fooled about them scars, but you ain't fooled me. Them scars didn't come from no pot of spaghetti. No way. Sarah Burns was off the couch in a second, and her teeth clenched like a sprung bear trap. You better just shut up. Dale laughed. I'll shut up, okay, but that don't change the truth. I said, why do you say stuff like that, Dale? Man, you got to be careful when you go slandering one of us. We're supposed to have save that for the enemy. Ain't no slander. Just fact. I know it same way Sarah Burns knowed my daddy kicked my ass when he found out about the chew. I seen her with her daddy. She got a shit family just like me. The blaze in Sarah Burns' eyes... Sorry, the fire in Sarah Burns' eyes blazed. You're a Thornton. You wouldn't know truth if it walked up behind you and bit your ass and stole your wallet. She sat back. You know what? I'm kind of tired of this paper anyway. Maybe we should just quit. We've made our point. I wanted to leap up and stop her, but I couldn't let Dale see us disagree without paying dearly after he was gone. We had published eight papers, in the course of which we had detailed each and every year of the sordid past of Mott's illegitimate twin-beamed alien son, including the two years he spent as Elvis's secret gay lover. I certainly didn't want to halt the presses before we completed our four-part four expose, and this confrontation between Sarah Burns and Dale Thornton threatened to do just that. Though I was responsible for the word smithery of about 90% of all written material, no way would I have had guts enough to continue without Sarah Burns' fierce resolve. Dale Thornton, I could have done without any time. Crispy pork rinds slid downhill from that moment. Sarah Burns said we needed to move on to other modes of terrorism, and that Dale Thornton was as stupid as he had, had always thought she had always thought, and she didn't want him around us too much longer, or our brain cells might start to melt. We printed only one more edition, in which I doubled up to complete reports on the Mott family tree. A few weeks later, Dale Thornton was unceremoniously dumped as unassistant editor, and Sarah Burns and I began other kinds of tactical assaults on those who wronged us. A box of fish guts planted in a locker here at the beginning of a long weekend. Analgesic balm spread lavishly there in someone's underpants while he was dressed down for P.E. By year's end, we had successfully distributed more than 20 hollow gumballs doctored with Tabasco sauce from a hypodermic syringe. All were single acts of vengeance requiring no protection from Dale Thornton. Sir Burns and I were on a roll. But that summer, Lemery saw me swimming at a public pool and asked me to into talked me into trying out for her AAU swim team. Sarah Burns and I began drifting away from each other. She said it was me, and I said it was her. For the first year, I ate like more of a pig than I am, just to show her I wouldn't get svelte and handsome and popular so she'd have to hate me. But as workouts increased in length and intensity, my eating barrage couldn't stand up to my changing metabolism, and I began to get occasional glimpses of my feet. Look, Sarah Burns said one day during our freshman year, after I'd been working out almost 11 months, if you keep eating like a starving biofran turned loose at the food circus just to prove me wrong about why we're friends, you'll die of a heart attack before you're 15, so stop already. It was a relief because I was actually starting to feel good about myself from swimming, at least better. And Lemery was ready to send me to Ripley's Believe It or Not to find out why I was swimming four to six thousand yards a day and still puffing up like a blowfish. But what if I'm not fat? I blurted in desperation. Will you still be my friend? God, Sarah Burns said, you're such a lame brain. It isn't me who'll go away. It's you. People will just look at you differently than they do now. Other people will like you and... You'll go to them. It's not a big deal, Eric. It's just the way things work. For the thousandth time, I protested, but she raised a scarred hand. Don't worry. I've always known this. It doesn't even hurt. Sir Burns wasn't completely right, though she wasn't completely wrong, either. We did spend less time together, but mostly just because swimming takes a lot of time. 
I tried to get her to turn out with me, but she gave me a quick graphic dermatology lesson on the effects of chlorine and intense sunlight on burn scars, and that was it. I still saw her almost every day, and we still did things together on a regular basis, but she struck up a cautious friendship with Dale Thornton, I think as a hedge against possible losses, and wasn't available as much of the time. I made it my life's resolution to refuse any invitation that excluded Sarah Burns, even though she rarely agreed to go anywhere with me. When I brought her name up, if one nose crinkled, I uninvited myself on the spot. That's how I stay fat for her now. Want to have an adventure? Ellaby and I navigate the Christian cruiser through the dusky streets. It's Saturday night, about 7.30, and we're killing time before the dance over at the school gym. What'll it be, he says. Zero to 13 miles an hour in the space of one short city block? Crank up the sound system and drive back and forth in front of Britain's place? Better, I said. Let's take her down to the Edison district. You want me to be an organ donor? The Edison district has a tavern for approximately every 3.5 people over the age of six, and Spokane absolutely depends on it to keep our crime rate equal to or above other U.S. cities of our relative size. There's somebody down there I need to talk to, I say. We won't be there long. No, Ellerby says, flipping a Yui. We probably won't. In the neighborhoods behind the Edison Strip, most streetlights are broken, and twisted street signs point in directions where there aren't streets. So it takes us a while to find West Reardon. Ellerby drops the cruiser to about 10 miles per hour so I can read the numbers. I've only been to Dale Thornton's place once, and that was back in junior high when he made Sarah Burns and we proved we liked him by going there. I went, but I didn't like him. Here. Ellerby pulls up in front of a ramshackle cottage with a tilted garage off to one side and several rusted-out cars and a truck on blocks in the front yard. This has to be it. I remember that truck. Be careful. I think a dog lives in it. Ellerby leaves the engine running, and I step onto a dirt road thinly coated with ice. A dim light shines from the living room, and I move cautiously up the sidewalk, I and the old truck from which I fully expect a saber-toothed junkyard dog mutt to spring flashing yellow eyes locked on my jugular. It doesn't happen. I take a deep breath and knock as Ellerby moves silently up the walk behind me. Canine thunder bursts forth from inside, followed by a deep, booming, SHUT UP! When the door opens, I'm staring at the three-day stippled face of Morton Thornton, a.k.a. Butch. I hope Dale never told him about the crispy pork rind story, or at least who wrote it. His beer-blurred eyes tell me he wouldn't remember anyway. Is Dale home? He squints suspiciously. Yeah, out back, in the garage. Okay if we talk with him? Okay with me, he says. If it's okay with him, go around and kick the door. And we hop off the side of the porch. And don't come knocking on my door at night without no appointment. Right friendly part of town, Ellaby whispers as we make our way through the pitch dark. Over batteries and car hoods and enough spare parts to build a spaceship. A bright light shines through the broken window pane in the garage door. And I peer in to see a body bent over the engine of a station wagon that is the match of Ellaby's from a negative universe. A radio on the workbench blares pure country and Dale sings along, amazingly, on key. My hard knock brings no response, so I follow Mr. Thornton's advice and give it a kick, bringing Dale's head up hard under the sharp rim of the hood. He says, shit, and turns down the radio. I'm surprised at the neatness of his makeshift work shop. Each tool hangs on the wall inside a meticulously drawn outline of that tool. The surface of the workbench is clean and the floor is swept. Dale stands, bright light shining in his eyes, holding his end wrench like a revolver recently fired. His legs spread like a gunslinger's. But he's so... small? Dale Thornton hasn't grown one inch since junior high school. His tight sleeveless t-shirt 
displays the same muscle definition outlining his washboard stomach, but he's little. Gail, I say. He squints. Who wants to know? It's Eric. Eric Calhoun. Who? Remember from junior high, I wrote that newspaper with you and Sarah Burns? He smiles a bit, steps forward. Scarface? He says, then, oh, fat boy. Yeah, that's me. He places the wrench carefully on the workbench, pulling a grease rag from his hip pocket. What the hell are you doing here? Who's this? Uh, this is Ellerby, I say, and Steve steps forward, offering his hand. Dale looks down at his own hand, still black with grease, smiles and shakes Ellerby's hand. Dale hasn't changed much. So, fat boy, what you doing here? I ain't seen you in three years or so. I thought you hated my guts. I smile sheepishly. No, nah, I say. I never hated your guts. I was just scared of you is all. Ellerby approaches the old Pontiac with reverence circling slowly, touching the rough, dark, gray, primed doors and mirrors, peering in under the hood at the engine highlighted by the drop light. Dale's eyes follow him suspiciously, then dart back to me. How is old Scarface? he asks. Not so hot. She's in the hospital. Got herself sick or something, huh? Too bad. I kind of liked her. She was a real hard ass. Yeah, well, I say. She's not sick like that. She's having head trouble. She just stopped talking one day. Wouldn't get out of her desk. They finally had some guys come and take her right from school. Dale moves closer to Ellerby as if to be certain he doesn't get away with any spare engine parts. That right. That don't sound like her. Thought she'd end up kicking somebody's ass like that prick Mott's. I smile. Quit talking before she could get around to that. So, how come... You come to see me. He looks at Ellerby and can't stand anymore. What you looking at? It's a challenge. Ellerby looks up in surprise. Nothing, he says. I mean, I've got a car just like this, and I've been looking for somebody to work the engine. Dealer's too expensive. You know a lot about this thing? Dale puffs up. I know everything about this thing. You want anything did to it, I'm your man. Of course, you've got to pay. Of course, Ellerby says back. Tell you what. I can do the body work on one of these babies, but I'm not much of an engine man. Maybe we can trade some labor. Maybe, Dale says. His defense is down a bit in the face of this common interest. I answer his original question. The reason I came to see you is, I remember once you told Sarah Burns that she didn't get her scars from a boiling pot of spaghetti. Remember that? Remember it? Shit. She, like, took my head off. That's how I knew I was right. You still think that? Dale smiles. Never heard her come out and deny it, did you? Why? What business is it a yours? The people at the hospital are just looking for a reason she might have quit talking. Dale leans against the car door. Well, there's a bunch of goddamn geniuses, he says. One look will give you all the reasons you want. I agree. Yeah, but they're looking for more. I mean... She's always looked like that, but she just stopped talking recently. Well, I don't know nothing about talking or not talking, but I'll tell you what. There wasn't no pot of spaghetti. You can count on that. Sarah Burns tell you that? Hell no, Scarface didn't tell nobody nothing. But I know. I would seen her with her dad a couple times, and I know. How? Dale stares as if I'm a dog turd on his plate. You guys see my old man? You think I can't tell when somebody's got a nasty pappy? Hell, I seen Sarah Burns with her daddy once, even before I knew he was kicking her ass regular and I could tell right off. You think her dad burned her? Dale shrugs. You figure it out. He looks a little closer at me. Hey, fat boy, you lost some weight, huh? And growed. I might have a hard time taking your, all your shit from, the, from you these days. He laughs. Guess I changed careers just in time. No, Dale, I say. I, I think you wouldn't have any trouble taking all my shit even today. Ellaby gets Dale's number for business purposes. And we're out of there. What do you think? I ask Ellaby as we glide through the darkened streets away from Dale Thornton's house toward the freeway. I think Dale Thornton lives in a very scary part of town, he says. 
And I think he knows about cars. Then he answers my real question. I think guys like Dale Thornton don't lie. So you think Sarah Burns' dad did something to her? Like, to her face? I don't know, he says. But when I want to know about swimming, I ask Lemery. When I want to know about my teeth, I ask my dentist. He glances over. Always go to the expert. If I wanted to know about hard times, I could do worse than to ask Dale Thornton. Sit back. Penelope's right, and I'm smart enough to have figured that, that out. But Sarah Burns is my friend. She was with me when nobody else was. In the days of my life, when my body embarrassed and humiliated me, every time anyone laid eyes on me, Sarah Burns, this person with 50 times my reason to be embarrassed and humiliated, walked with me, even ahead of me. I can't imagine someone hurting her like that on purpose. Chapter 6 Analysis. After we've uh, gotten through Chapter 6, a few things are, are sort of obvious and important. Um, Number one, we're introduced to Virgil Burns, and Virgil is, is a very important character, and he establishes himself as an antagonist, a person who is working against um, Eric, and it seems like Sarah. And our list of antagonists seems to be growing. We started with Motz, the assistant principal who becomes uh, like the assistant principal at the high school. Um, Dale Thornton, who is both antagonist and kind of supporting character, um, and uh, now Virgil Burns. And so there seems to be quite a bit of conflict in this story, which makes it a little bit more interesting, to be honest. Uh, the next thing is we see Eric trying to figure things out, and the first place that he goes to find this out is from that antagonist. We're given a flashback where we see how crispy pork rinds, which had become something that was um, a positive for Eric and for Sarah and for Dale, uh, turns into something that's negative and they eventually disband. And it stems from um, a comment that uh, Dale Thornton makes about Sarah Burns uh, and her burns, where she, he claims that there's no possible way that her burns came from a, a pot of spaghetti that was pulled over onto herself. And he says he knows this because um, he has a father that is very similar to uh, Sarah Burns' father. And his father, not a nice man, uh, he says he's a mean pappy, and he says he gets the same feeling from Sarah's dad. And she reacts in such a way that makes him believe that really that's true. And Eric, I don't think he really ever thought about it until he had to. Um, and now that he has to, he puts those things together too and it makes sense to him that perhaps there is something to, the, to truth being that, that maybe Sarah Burns was burned by her own father and that's a... That's a revelation that's really kind of difficult for him to, to stomach. And so uh, that's where we're left at the end of chapter 6. And we'll keep on going.